Okay, so welcome everybody um, to our presentation of the Kavanaugh Award and especially to uh, David Walker and his family and also our past presidents that join us here tonight. Such a beautiful evening. So we're going to start off with the invocation by Rosemary. Um, for our honored guests, let's begin with a prayer for our veterans. Lord, you know that it can be difficult for a person who has returned from battle or stressful military service to reintegrate to normal everyday life. You know that veterans can feel isolated and alone and even in the midst of their friends and families because there are few around who understand their experience. So I ask you, place in the path of our veterans those who do understand or strive like our honored guest, that they may feel less alone. You know their deeds, their hard work, their perseverance. You know their needs, both material and spiritual. Please draw each one closer to you and grant them peace. Lord, thank you for this beautiful sunny day here on campus and the thought-filled hours of information sharing that just happened for us. Thank you for this food we are about to enjoy, and thank you for the hands that so carefully prepared it. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. The Reverend John J. Kavanaugh Award is conferred each year on an alum who has performed outstanding service in the field of government, patriotism, public service, or politics. On behalf of the Alumni Association, and as a proud former resident of Kavanaugh Hall, I'm honored and privileged to introduce this year's recipient, David Walker, of the class of 1981. David is the president and CEO of the Coalition to Salute America's Heroes, a nonprofit, nonpartisan charity that provides support for veterans who were seriously wounded in Iraq and Afghanistan. The debt that we all owe these brave men and women who served our country can never be repaid, but David has made its made it his life's mission to do just that. In return for the sacrifices they made for us, David and the Coalition to Salute America's Heroes ensure that these wounded veterans and their families receive the support that they need to restore their hope and rebuild their lives. The Coalition assists veterans by providing direct financial aid in their times of crisis, supporting a variety of programs to help them readjust to civilian life, finding homes for the many who have no place of their own to lay their heads, and encouraging a variety of therapies to deal with the post-traumatic stress that afflicts so many of them. Under David's leadership, the coalition has undergone a complete overhaul of its oversight, increased transparency, and increased the hiring of combat wounded veterans. At present, more than two-thirds of the coalition's employees are wounded veterans or their caregivers. In August of 2015, David and the Coalition to Salute America's Heroes established an expendable fellowship pledge of $25,000 to support wounded veterans who are enrolled in the graduate programs at Notre Dame. Together with the graduate school, the coalition works to identify potential candidates and award their fellowship to these students, many of whom have 30% or greater disability from their injuries. Through his dedication to America's wounded veterans, David truly embodies the meaning of public service and the legacy of Father Kavanaugh. Please join me in recognizing this year's recipient of the Kavanaugh Award, David Walker. Okay, thank you. And to the academy, hey, this is empty. <laughs> yeah, you take it, yeah, exactly. Um, the legacy of Father Kavanaugh, how humbling that is for me to be here. After I've researched him additionally, it is such an honor 
It is such an honor. And I know those are words you've heard before in the past with past recipients. Um, but it always is good to hear again. To those of you from the Alumni Association, Dolly, Jane, the rest of the team, thank you. This is an honor to be here. As Paul Harvey would say, for those of you that were on the committee to determine among the multiple nominations that have been received, review, cried over, prayed over, as Paul Harvey would say, you're going to hear a little bit of the rest of the story, which I would hope would deepen your conviction even greater for the decision you made. Not just for myself, not just for our colleagues at the coalition, but for what the award will mean going forward in the distinction it gives to the work that we do at the coalition every day. I have a lot to say. I particularly was intrigued when Jane said I would have uh, 15 to 20 minutes. I think that was 10 to 15. <laughs> but then I heard there's a hospitality that goes to 10 o'clock. But I think you'll enjoy the story. And that's what we have to say. So I thank you. My um, mind is reeling. This is unreal. I am getting ahead of myself, and one of the reasons my wife is here tonight, my lodestar of 37 years, going on 37 years, <laughs> is so that I don't get full of myself. A satirist once said, a man can make a fool of himself and not know it. That, of course, unless he is married. <laughs> Gentlemen, you know what I'm talking about. I love you, Kathy. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Our two daughters are present, too, which we are equally proud of. One has the distinction of being a graduate of the University of Notre Dame in 2008. She applied a path similar to her father. I graduated in 1981 with a government degree. She graduated in 2008 with a political science degree. And I think the debate continues. Is it government or political science? And one day, it'll be back to government. Our second daughter, Lindsay, applied her own path. Um, she's a chef, a renowned chef in her own way. Uh, she has the distinction of serving under two administrations for a limited period of time under each, the Bush and the Obama administration. She has the distinction of one of the few people in this country that has a photo with President-elect Obama and Michelle dressed up right before they went to St. John's Church when they were leaving the Blair House. She now works at Whole Foods managing some 20 people. You can't judge a book by its cover. Four foot eight, four foot nine, there's a lot of vigor, and we're very proud of you. My career, perhaps like your own, has taken many turns, and I've always thought that my success was guided by a couple principles. First, it was born of faith. It always starts there. The second were the influences I encountered here at the University of Notre Dame. This was not all part of some grand plan. I grew up in a blue collar family. We were honest, hardworking people. Academics were not the aspiration, though my parents, whom are not here any longer, respected and supported my aspiration to study. And I must admit, they were a bit surprised on occasion, by my successes. But their goal, 
was to assure my character and integrity, which I think speaks quite well of them. But along the way, I had good fortune to meet a number of seasoned academicians. And the first was a man by the name of Dan Ryan. Dan Ryan, a Fulbright Scholar out of the uh, University of Minnesota. There's a famous speech that Hubert Humphrey gave to the UN. His pen helped that speech zing. He was an instructor at the College of Lake County in Lake County, Illinois, a junior college. I graduated early from high school in December of 76. I attended the junior college because it was convenient, it was cheap, it had a great tennis team, of which I played on, and it had some great courses. And as I learned later, it had a great instructor by the name of Dan Ryan, who asked me a lot of questions, whom challenged me, whom became my mentor. And at that time, I doubt I even had the word mentor in my vocabulary. But that's what he was. In talking to Dan about my next stage, I listed and I ticked off a list of colleges I wanted to attend. And I remember I could see him with his books. We're leaving the classroom. And he goes, well, have you ever thought of the University of Notre Dame? I said, no. Where is it? That, I'm only kidding. <laughs> I said, no, I hadn't. But I put it on my list. And I was admitted. In 1979, I transferred. And as I soon learned when I was at the North Dining Hall for orientation, I was part of one of the first mid-semester transfer classes. I walked into the North Dining Hall, and there were a handful of people. And I remarked to somebody, we must be in the wrong room. There's nobody here. Are you here for the orientation for the transfer students? I said, yes, yeah. We were under a microscope. Earlier tonight, on every occasion when I come back to the university as well for a football game, there's always discussion. What dorm did you live in? What did you study? I had two years. During those two years, nearly every semester I took 18 hours. I grabbed everything I could. I also applied myself by a number of internships. I took an internship with then city attorney Rich Hill, Congressman John Bradamus. I was vice chairman of the Republican Club on campus when I worked with the congressman. And three semesters working at the invite of Professor Robert Vasoli. Some of the audience are starting to smile a little bit and remember him. In an honors program for the criminology department, and I worked over at the South Bend Juvenile Facility for three semesters as part of an internship. I gra grabbed everything I could. The grades took a hit, but the insight and the knowledge I left with are forever. My last day here in 1980, I walked across campus to visit with Dean Waddick to say thanks. I also asked him a question. 
How did I get here? What was the tipping point in my admission to this wonderful university? And he goes, well, let me check. And back then, there were paper files. <laughs> Pulled the drawer open. He goes, yes, I remember distinctly. He goes, it was your essay. It was one of the best we've ever read. You basically, very simply and genuinely said, what you expected to get out of Notre Dame and what you expected to get back. He made some comments about to have a good, wonderful life and I'll have a good career because of the experiences I had here at Notre Dame. And I'm sure that was standard stuff, but he was a formidable person. It meant a lot. And I said goodbye. Graduation weekend came back with two proud parents. And we spiraled up the staircase on graduation weekend to greet, be greeted by Father Hesburgh and Father Joyce. I think those spiral staircases were over there in a building it was recently being taken down. I think it was the McKenna building. You reach a platform, large atrium, a lot of light, and many of you in this room met Father Hesburgh, and you know when you talk to him, that conviction came forward. He looked right at me, like he did many of you, and he asked the question, what's next? What are you going to do? And I said, I'll be in corporate and government public affairs. That's my aspiration. He goes, you will do it. You will get it. So there I left with a sheepskin from the University of Notre Dame and a deep conviction that I was going to succeed, that I was going to be a force for good in the world. A few months later, I started a position in downtown Chicago at Standard Oil of Indiana, and you guessed it, in corporate, government, and public affairs. And tonight, tonight, I am honored to have Billy Glenn Wiley, my first boss, who had the enlightenment and the wisdom to hire me. <laughs> and he's a University of Texas graduate. <laughs> Not just an undergrad in law too. So, God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. You bet. And if you're ever up in Chicago, Billy Glenn lives at 3400 Lakeshore Drive, so you can <laughs> stop in and, and see him. <clears throat> yeah, so, there you go. A few years later, God connected the dots. In November of 1982, I drove down to the University of Notre Dame, my alma mater, just like many of you do when you fly across country to come back for a football game, to get refreshed, to walk the campus, to reflect, to pray. And at that time, I was reflecting on what the next steps we're going to be about my romantic life. In January of 1983, President Ronald Reagan introduced me to Kathy, my wife. And I'll let her tell you the story about how Ronald Reagan introduced us. But there you go. 
God connects the dots onward and upward. As my career goes, I was doing honorable work. I worked for the National Association of Manufacturers for 21 years. During the latter part, I was the youngest member of the senior management team and carried that same type of responsibility to the National Glass Association in Tyson's Corner in Virginia. It was back in 2011 that Kathy and I took a trip to Israel. It was a life-changing trip. If you've never been to Israel, your faith life will blossom even further to realize the depth of the reality we know that's founded in Christ, but in terms of how the Bible guides our life. We strolled along the strands of the Caesarea. We climbed the heights of the Mount of Beatitudes. We attempted to walk on the Sea of Galilee, but we realized soon that there is a Lord, and we are not him. Famous line from a movie, right? All right, and we floated on the Dead Sea. The best part of the trip was to visit the Wailing Wall. And at the Wailing Wall, there's a tradition. You write on a little piece of paper a prayer, and you slip that little piece of paper in a crevice and revealed for the first time publicly the prayer I made was to get a career to serve all mankind. A guiding star here at Notre Dame is just that. We're taught to serve beyond ourselves. And it's a line from the Newt Rockne movie where another Father Cavanaugh says, when we serve mankind, we serve the Lord. And I really believe that when we wait on God to connect the dots, our lives will work out just fine. I was at the fork in the road when I met a gentleman by the name of Dan Ryan at a junior college in Lake County, Illinois, who became my mentor. The mentor baton was passed off to Billy Glenn Wiley when I got my first job. As we know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, from a career standpoint, one of the most important parts of achieving is your first boss. And it wasn't long after that Kathy and I got back from Israel that I got a phone call that would change my life and lead me to be here with each of you tonight. For many years, I had been active in volunteer service, doing a number of charities. It was 9-11 and the war that prompted in 2004, that heart, that movement forward to serve combat wounded veterans. A group was formed to do just that. And I was invited to the formation meeting of that organization, which at this moment, I serve as their president and CEO. But as we all know, and we come to that football game in, on Saturday, there's words that will be said prior to that game as we're bringing that flag to be flown. Sacred honor. The men and women that put their lives on the line for the freedoms we've had, had for a long time. I have a distinct honor to work with incredible people, incredible combat veterans that have done just that and have paid a sacrifice. Tonight, we have one of our, and my good friend, Dan Acosta with us, Airman Dan Acosta, whom was struck by an EOD. Dan? (laughs) 
Dan paid a price with his left arm. But his intellect and his heart, they couldn't take. And uh, Dan, God bless you for what you continue to do uh, for the veterans and for the rest of the community at large. And thanks for being here tonight. It's an honor to have you here, bud. Okay? Yeah. So there I was. I was volunteering for a group called the Coalition to Salute America's Heroes when it formed. I became a volunteer and then later became a volunteer board member. And it, watching it, I could see the issues associated with weaknesses in transparency, weaknesses in management, and the like. And it got to a point where a change was being made. And I received a phone call one evening from Major General Jack Singlaw to ask me to serve as President and CEO of the Coalition to Salute America's Heroes. I was not expecting that call any more than I was expecting the call from Dolly to say, you won. You're going to be the recipient of a Kavanaugh Award. Where I think I probably said, what? Is this a joke? <laughs> okay. So at the time, I had to move from a higher paying job to take this position. And it took a lot of discussion with Kathy. It took a lot of discussion with the Lord. But there, as I told my old boss, CEO at the time at the National Glass Association, something was tugging at the heart. So I took the position and organizationally it needed improvement. I quickly changed the culture. We adjusted staffing. We became more transparent. I did the easy things. Those are things you do because you know how to do them when you're a manager of an organization for some period of time. The tough task was the reputation. It's changing the views of the way in which the core mission of the organization was sound and we needed to change the views, particularly of the charity rating agencies. And that was a tough task. That's hard to repair a reputation. The charity rating agencies can be like an old church, old country church. Long on memory, short on forgiveness. But as this young lady over here said, she took it from me, so we made advancements and we moved it forward and they're more than just words. We have moved favorably in many cases with our charity rating agencies. They give us four stars across the board for transparencies and the piece de resistance was last July when the Better Business Bureau went out with a national press release to the American public and listed the coalition to salute America's heroes as one of the top 26 veteran service organizations in the country. There are over 40,000 veteran service organizations in the country. You cannot believe the movement forward that that meant for us in so many ways and how important that was for us. So what is the coalition to salute America's heroes and what did the board, the alumni board, judge us on? We the coalition, our core mission is direct emergency financial aid. And what that means is combat wounded veterans, even today, would call in and use words like repossess, foreclose, evict. We need food on the table. We, on average, provide $1,500 to $1,600 to keep them under roof, keep the heat on during the winter, keep the car moving so they can get to their job. We do that so they don't use another set of words like homelessness, divorce, suicide, abuse. The Coalition to Salute America's Heroes has been very active on the homeless issue. We have provided funding for a number of transitional housing projects throughout the country. In our genesis, we actually were building homes. We actually got a project over the goal line in Washington, D.C., where we provided 
significant funding for transitional housing for female veterans. The rate of homelessness for the female veteran population is four times greater than the men. And the female veterans on staff will tell you it's not homelessness, it's couch surfing. It nonetheless is symptomatic of a problem that will be here in 10 to 20 years if we don't act on it now. We also are very active with regard to working with veterans courts when we talk about abuse and things like that. There's often a trigger and that oftentimes is money that causes the issues associated with that or PTS or things like that that we have um, seen in the, in the press. The best thing we do, however, is that one-on-one. -on -one. We do that day to day. We have a staff that two-thirds are combat wounded spouses or caregivers. We have a very small staff. We have 10 full-time professionals and 50 part-time. But the best thing we do, and the way we make our love visible outside of our core mission, is that one-on-one. -on -one. And if I could indulge you with an email I received from a young man a couple years ago. And interestingly, I had received three such emails that year. Whenever I'm out, wherever I'm at, traveling, I always have my business cards. And when I meet a combat wounded veteran, I give him my business card with my cell phone number. And I always say, if you have a problem, an issue, you contact me. We have caseworkers on staff. You contact me. And I, tongue in cheek, with some humor, attempted humor, ask them, but I never want to hear from them because I don't want them to ever have a problem. But if they do, catch me 24 7. Two years later, after I did such that, with three individuals, in 2017 I received similar messages, overtures that I'm going to read to you now. Mr. Walker, I'm in desperate need of some advice, some assistance, just someone to listen. On December 22nd, my wife announced to the family, including my kids, that she was leaving us. Later that day, I tried to kill myself, but I couldn't even do that right. I swallowed a bunch of pills and woke up in the hospital with my kids laying next to me. It was at that moment I realized they needed me. I was released from the hospital on Christmas Eve. Mr. Walker, I have no idea what to do. Everybody I've talked to doesn't know either. I'm doing everything in my power to keep from sticking a 12 gauge in my mouth. The VA is calling me every day, twice a day to make sure I'm okay but I'm not okay. I'm lost and my kids are scared to death because I have been honest with them about what is going on. I reached out to over 15 organizations and been shot down every time. In the message, he also talked about how his wife had squandered the money and he was in arrears. That's when we go to action. That's our best opportunity to serve. And we did just that. And then I met with him for lunch. And I met with him for coffee. And then we got him integrated into a local program with like-minded individuals on the suicide issue. A year later, I got an email from him. Mr. Walker, good news, I got a job. He was healing. A couple months back, he fell a little bit into that depression, into that moment. We stepped in, provided him some opportunities to get to some clinics, get some additional help. And we're not the only group that was working with him, no doubt. And then I got an email from his his strange wife, whose, whose love had not ceased 
but the depth of the problem was on us. We see the headlines even of last week, even for active duty veterans with suicide, and it's growing and growing. And fortunately, there are groups out there, any number of groups that are dedicated to this area, it's the number one thing we can do is to invest. And that's why I said earlier, this award, yeah, I'm honored. I'm the alumni. I take this thing home. Um, but it's for much more. It's how today on our social media, our men and women, combat wounded veterans, embrace this and put this out there that I was here tonight. So that people can continuously support what we're doing to do just what we do. That's one. I want to touch on one other issue, and it's uh, another area where we're very active in, and that's employment. We walk the talk, we employ the combat wounded veterans. But we're very active in terms of the scholarship, getting people not just a job, but a career for life. At the University of Toledo, we have a scholarship. Their veteran cohort population is fifth in the country against their total population. The day I received the email from the young man telling me that he, good news, I got a job, I was in Florida. I was about ready to present a scholarship to the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority for black female veterans that were sorority members within that cohort. We provided scholarships to Dog Tag Bakery and Howard University. And there's two I want to share with you. And one is very dear, and we'll talk on that in a minute. But the first one is Purdue University. There's a wall over here of significant benefactors. And on, on that wall is a man's name by the name of Ken Rickey. I think you all know who he is. I had the honor to meet him a couple years ago when he and I we're representative of the loan and two benefactors to Purdue University at a press conference in West Lafayette to provide funding. In the case of Ken, he provided an aircraft, a $500,000 aircraft, to teach combat wounded on how to fly aircraft. The first seven graduates of that program now have jobs, meaningful jobs, that would be even heartening to Ken, because of his conviction towards the aviation industry, and particularly what he does, those scholarships, five of them, came directly through the Coalition to Salute America's Heroes. I was down there a couple months back to provide three additional scholarships to three young men that were dedicated to a wheelchair, whom are excited about doing the same thing. The first graduate of that program was a gentleman by the name of Jason Gilbert, a double leg amputee who was sitting alongside Michelle Obama at the State of the Union address some five or six years ago. We talk about satisfying work. We were talking about the BYU game. We were at the Chalk Talk. And I can't remember the gentleman's last name, Greg, but. We started, and it was very embryonic, we started discussing the idea of a scholarship program here at the University of Notre Dame. Patrick Kaiser, who was to be here tonight, who no longer works with the University of Notre Dame, retired last year. He and I fashioned, a couple years back, what is known as the Coalition to Salute America's Heroes Fellowship Program at the graduate level. You remarked on the $25,000. There's been an additional commitment as of last year for another $25,000 that the Coalition of Salute America's Heroes is giving to the fellowship program here at the University of Notre Dame to teach additionally, provide additional funding for graduate level education. How many of you are going to the Virginia game this weekend? Okay, you'll see a young man by the name of Jamie uh, Hentick. I will be with him tomorrow along with Luis Morales. 
Reagan Jones just sent me an email a couple of hours ago. They are the first beneficiaries of the Coalition to Salute America's Heroes Fellowship, and they're doing some phenomenal stuff. Jamie will be honored on the field on Saturday. I am content we are doing the Lord's work in so many different ways. I'm not sure if it was here or perhaps later through some reading. And you all probably have heard this in your own careers before. But there's a truth. When you are doing something you love, you never have to go to work. You are going where you want to go. You are doing what you want to do. You are doing what you would do anyway if you were not getting paid. So, alumni board and attendees here, you are honoring me tonight for having fun. God bless you. Maybe this is why everyone in ministry is so happy. They're working in the Lord's vineyard and they never have to go to work. I want to thank you for this wonderful honor. Thank you for the wonderful evening. I will treasure it all my days. And if I happen one day to come face to face with Father Kavanaugh, I will be bragging a little bit and I'm sure he'll be quite pleased. Thank you. My heart is flowing, and, um, as well as my family's, and um, I can't say any more, so thank you. <laughs>